G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here, it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm making a reply video to Adam Shumpus XXX. It's been one of those days where my thumb's nearly fallen off from RSI on the thumb pad. But anyway, Adam, thanks mate, it's a whole lot easier to answer these questions when I'm not being called 957 kinds of a cunt the way Gary does in the middle of the his presentations. Um, part 1, you mentioned people telling you that a turbocharger is a kind of a turbine, it is. It's a power recovery turbine in the exhaust. And as I said to somebody on one of the threads today, yeah, go to the top of the class, a turbocharger is a windmill in a car. It's the only place to put a windmill in a car. However, unless you're gonna drive above 10,000 feet above mean sea level, there really is no point in turbocharging a car like compressing the inlet charge. You compress the air so that you can get more oxygen into the cylinder to burn the fuel with. Compressing the inlet charge is really clever on aeroplanes and as a bit of a marketing jism exercise the automotive industry took it up after the Second World War because so many American fighter planes had turbochargers on them. In the 1920s and 30s, the Europeans used to compress the inlet mixtures of their racing cars with gear-driven superchargers run off the crankshaft. Okay? So, <clears throat> during the Second World War, the English and the Germans, they used superchargers. The Americans, they used turbochargers, right? Now, just to show you what's going on, and how much energy is involved where, bear with me, I'm going to show you with an energy flow diagram for a big engine. Here we go. Now, over here, on the left-hand side, you've got all the energy that's in the fuel, right? And in this case, it's 5,410 horsepower. That's 100% of the energy that's available to the engine. Now, you burn it, and this is your exhaust, okay? Now, total energy in the exhaust is 51.6%, right? 2,790 horsepower. Now, you can't get at the chemical energy, 250 horsepower or 4.6%. This is made up of carbon monoxide, which you can burn, 3.1% of the energy that was in the fuel, and methane, 80 horsepower, 1.5% of the energy that was in the fuel. This stuff here is what they call sensible or temperature energy in the exhaust, and that's 2,540 horsepower, or 47%, right? So you've got 47% of the energy, which was in the petrol, right, goes straight out the exhaust pipe. And remember I said the English use superchargers? Okay, so, down here, we've got thermal losses from the cylinder, 660 horsepower, which is 12.2%. Uh, and we've got indicated output before the supercharger is 1,960 horsepower or 36.2 percent, right? Then you've got 140 horsepower, 2.6 percent supercharger input. You've got supercharger losses going up there, 60 horsepower, 1.1 percent. So your indicated output after the supercharger is 1,900 horsepower. So you've actually lost 60 horsepower due to your supercharger, right? Uh, then you've got your mechanical losses, 300 horsepower or 5.6%. Um, your total thermal losses, 1,020 horsepower or 18.9%, right? Um, up here you've got radiation losses, that's the you know, just radiant heat off the side of the engine block. 290 horsepower or 5.3 percent. Conduction loss to the air, 600 horsepower. That's 11.1 uh, percent, I think. No, one, uh, it's difficult to see whether that's a cross hatching. I think let's call it 1 percent. Yes, conduction loss to the oil is 130, no, that must be 11.1%, yeah, 600 horsepower, 11.1%. Conduction loss to the oil, 2.4%. Um, so down here, your brake power output is 1,600 horsepower, or 
of the energy that was in the fuel. So you got 29.6% coming out the crankshaft of the engine, 2,540 horsepower going out the exhaust pipe. And this thing has got a gear-driven supercharger to compress the inlet mixture because it's got to go up to 30,000 feet and fight the Germans. Okay, so there's a lot of energy in the exhaust and if you've got a supercharger for driving at above 10,000 feet, right? Not many people drive above 10,000 feet in Australia because we've got no mountains above 7,500. Mount Kosciuszko is about 7,500 feet. So in Australia, no need for a turbocharger at all. What can we do with the energy that's in the exhaust? I suggest putting a power recovery turbine in the exhaust and using it to run a reduction gearbox, to run a drive shaft, to run the alternator. All right? So that way you can decouple the headlights from the crankshaft and you can run the headlights and all the rest of your electrical system, your stereos and your heated steering wheel covers and your seven-way adjustable seats and DVD players in the back seat for the kiddies, run all that on the exhaust gas. Don't run it on the crankshaft torque which you're going to use to drive the gearbox. Right? That's, that's what I think is the next step beyond Sunfoils is to have a turbine alternator drive. All right, now just to show you that it is possible, here's another little schematic which shows you a thing called a right turbo compound where it was an 18-cylinder radial engine, right? Two rows of nine cylinders. And behind the second row, they had three of these power recovery turbines, 120 degrees around. Each turbine drank the exhaust gases from six cylinders and uh, basically whereas Pratt and Whitney got little return for their massive effort on the compound R436051 the rival Wright did achieve colossal success with the corresponding development of the R3350 duplex cyclone Called the Turbo Compound, a registered name, this was a family of related civilian and military engines which stemmed from a prototype funded mainly by the US Navy, which went on test in January 1949. The basic 18-cylinder engine was almost unchanged. The new part was at the back. Here were added three turbines spaced around the engine 120 degrees apart, driven by the exhaust gas, and the new feature, putting their power into the crankshaft. The turbines were of the blowdown type, taking gas at 800 to 815 degrees Celsius at supersonic velocity. Each had a diameter of about 279 millimetres or 11 inches, with stellite blades welded to the disc, rotating at full power at 23,200 rpm. Each drove a radial quill shaft, bevel reduction gear, hydraulic coupling and final spur reduction gear. The whole assembly was mounted on and in a rear extension of the crankcase, each turbine being fed by the shortest possible pipes from six cylinders. At a cost of some 245 kilograms, or 540 pounds in weight, the turbo compound gave takeoff power increased from 2,700 horsepower to 3,500 horsepower or to 3,700 horsepower with water injection and with specific consumption reduced by 20% to about 0.39. This automatically meant aircraft range extended by at least 20%, even if the extra power was not used to lift additional fuel, bracket as in fact it was done in such aircraft as the DC-7, DC-7B, DC-7C, and the L-1049C to 1649. Adding the turbines required no extra control system and had no significant effect on cylinder conditions and had a useful silencing effect. Wright began delivering turbo compounds in 1950 and by the time production ran out in 1958 had delivered 12,000. Okay? So, they went from 2,700 horsepower to two, uh, 3,700 horsepower by putting windmills in the exhaust pipe and having the windmills drive the crankshaft because the engine already had a supercharger. I'm suggesting driving the alternator on a windmill in the exhaust pipe, right? That's before we get to Gary's questions. Now, where Gary says that he didn't ever suggest putting a windmill onto a car, three minutes into his movie, Warbles on a lot, draw drop a lot, or whatever it was, Warbles draw drop a lot, I heard him say it'd be better to ta have a wind turbine in the radiator grill to save energy. That was where I bailed out of that film. Right? Quote two, a windmill is a wind turbine. 
but a windmill is a very old-fashioned thing that they used to use for grinding grain. But essentially the terms are interchangeable. On the bit about the electrical regenerative braking. Um, <clears throat> before I put a solar panel on the car, I used to drive into town at 100 k's, and when I got to a sign which says, please limit your exhaust braking, and that sign was 100 metres to the north of the 80 kilometre an hour speed limit, I used to maintain power cruising at 100 k's till I got to that exhaust brake sign. Then I would pop the throttle, take my foot right off it, and I prided myself on how the car decelerated to the point where as I crossed the 80k sign, I was doing 80k's. With the Mark III Sunfoil on the roof, I arrive at exactly the same place. I pop the throttle at 100 kilometres an hour at the, you know, limit your exhaust brake sign. And instead of being 80 kilometres an hour when I hit the 80 kilometre sign, I go 150 metres past the sign before the car has slowed down to 80 kilometres an hour. So my car was doing electric regenerative braking before I put the solar panel on the roof. With the solar panel on the roof, my battery is so full that when I get to the, 80, to the, exhaust, regener the exhaust brake limit sign, I pop the throttle, the car's got a lot of energy in it, about a kilowatt of energy stored in the car as kinetic energy rolling down the road. That kilowatt of energy moving the car turns the back wheels. The back wheels turn the diff. The diff turns the drive shaft. The drive shaft, and my car's front wheel drive, what am I saying? Um, but anyway, the wheels turn the gearbox. The gearbox turns the engine. The engine's got no fuel in it, so it's being pushed around by the kinetic energy of the car going down the road. And what's on the front of the engine? There's a two to one step up drive to the alternator and if the battery's flat, the alternator is turning your kinetic energy from driving the car into electricity and storing it in the battery. So that's already happening. If you want to start engineering some need to set up the production line, and I doubt that Gary has either. What I'm doing with the Sunfoil is simple and it's cost effective and anybody can do it. All right, and I've now got Hatomaruf accepting the fact that um, I actually used to get up half an hour before sunrise and make 15 minute battery readings and I've spent the whole bloody day transcribing on the phone some, you know, just one or two days worth to, to let him know what's going on. But yeah, the debunkers have recognised the fact that my fuel log is real, my savings are real. My stab in the dark is if you put a sunfoil on every car in the world and every truck in the world, you'd save an average across the fleet figure of 33%, right? Now that represents 15 million barrels of oil per day because at the moment we're burning 45 million barrels of oil per day in the road transport fleet. Okay, your quote three answers quote one where Gary says he never said anything about putting a windmill on a car but in quote three you're talking about him putting a turbine in the grill. That was my point entirely. Now, a turbine in the grill is going to make milliamps because it's so small. Okay, well, look, this is a one and a half metre diameter wind turbine. Now, I haven't put it together yet, but there it sits. And uh, it weighs 17 kilograms. It makes 300 watts in uh, 30 mile an hour of wind. And to do that, you're looking at um, about 40 kilograms, I think, of drag, right? So 80 pounds of drag from a one and a half metre diameter windmill. And somewhere you're going to have to have this thing on your car and either have the blades feathered or you know, have it jump up out of your bonnet or something. Basically, the only way to use the wind to break a car is to pop a parachute like a bloody jet fighter, you know, when it's got to, too short of a runway. Sort of the point I'm making is that Gary's suggestions are wildly impractical, incredibly untested, where they're not physically impossible, and who the hell's got the money for it? Whereas Sunfoils, $150 for the panel, $65 for the wood, the paint, the glue, the screws, yeah, 50 bucks for the regulator. Okay, and... Uh, my son saved an average of 15% on the highway and 38% in city driving with his Brumby. Ciao.